Greetings, dear LLBN family and friends. I'm Sheila Hodgkin. In the name of Jesus, I'd love to welcome you to LLBN worship. You are our global congregation. And so wherever you are, any place in the world, we are grateful that you are here. And it is my prayer that you are blessed and that the Spirit of God will enter your heart that you will receive a, a wonderful blessing um, at our worship today. May God bless you, and thank you for joining us. Join with us as we celebrate Jesus in this coming Sabbath.
Hello, everyone. Please join me for a word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, we come before you today in the name of Jesus because you are our good Father. For you have adopted us into your family. You have claimed us as your own children. And you have just uh, as the prodigal father waited for his son at the gates, you are waiting and watching in the gates of heaven for us to return to you. And so I want to stand on your word in Matthew 7 that says that uh, you wish to give us good gifts, which includes the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so today we ask that the Spirit come down upon us, that comes down upon Pastor Dan and he gives your message and he preaches your word and comes down upon each of us that we may be able to accept that message, we may be able to receive your good gifts today. And so we thank you for everything that you've done for us and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, our family of believers. You know, before I came, or before the show today, before the worship time, Pastor Dan was talking to me about another evangelism uh, series. But then he asked me, Ganem, Jesus coming, Jesus coming soon. And then he paused and smiled and he said, he could be coming today. Well, that's a very sobering thought. What if Jesus come today? And we don't know whether he comes today or tomorrow or 10 years from now. We don't know. But until that moment, LLBN is committed to share the gospel, the good word of Jesus Christ, to fulfill the great commission of going into the world and preaching the good news of Jesus. And that's what we're committed to do. As a ministry that runs 24-7, nonstop, going around the world, we ask you to consider LLBN in your offering to help us continue this mission of reaching into the world. It is through your support over the last 25 years, and miraculously, we only grew bigger. It never ended up to our demise, but rather to the growth of the ministry of LLBN. So whatever you're comfortable in giving, whatever you feel like you can afford to give, What goes into this ministry goes strictly and directly to serve our Lord Jesus. Thank you for your generosity, and may God bless you on this wonderful Sabbath day. Hi, children. It's your time again. I have a wonderful story for you. Once upon a time, there was a king. He had a magnificent kingdom. He had a castle. He had people, and the people loved him very, very much. And the most important thing was his princess. He had a beautiful princess, and this princess loved him, and he loved the princess very much. It was time for the princess to get married. So the 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 king decided, I'm going to invite three of the most eligible bachelors, the most eligible prince that also adore the princess to come and talk to the princess. The first prince, his name was Andre. Now, Andre was the most handsome of prince in all the land. He knew it, and he was proud of it, and he loved the princess very, very much, and he adored the princess very much. The second person, the second prince, his name was Drew. Now, Drew was strong. He was the strongest of all princes in the land, and he knew it, and he loved the princess very much, and he adored the princess very much. The third person, the third prince, what's your name? That's right. That's it. He was the wise prince. He was the wisest of princes, prince of all the land. And he adored the princess, and he loved the princess very much also. 
So the king thought, I need to decide. I am not going to decide for the princess. I'm going to let the princess decide for herself what's going to happen and what she wants. So the princess thought and she thought and then she thought. And finally, she came up with the idea. She led the whole crowd to, the end, to this big field. And in this big field, at the edge of this big field was this deep, deep cliff. And this deep cliff fell very deep. So then the princess turns to Andre. Where's Andre? There's Andre. Turns to Andre and says to Andre, what are you going to do for me? You love me so much. How are you going to protect me from this ledge? And Andre says, I am strong, princess. I'm going to carry you, and I can carry you three feet from the ledge, and you will never fall. The princess goes, whoa, and everybody goes, whoa. Then the prince, princess turns to Drew, and Drew, and turns to Drew and asks Drew the same question. You love me so much. How are you going to protect me from the ledge? And the prince says, I am stronger. I'm going to kick you one foot from the, prince, from the ledge and you will never fall. And everybody goes, whoa. Then it was the third prince. The third prince, she turns to the third prince. What's your name again? That's right. And the third prince, she says, you love me so much. How are you going to protect me from the ledge? And the third prince says, I'm going to protect you by keeping you away from the ledge. I'm going to keep you as far away from the ledge as possible. In fact, I'm going to keep you by building a wall here so you will never, ever fall over. Who do you think the princess chose to be her prince? That's right, children. The princess chose the wise prince. Why do you think that's so? Because that prince took the princess because she's so precious. You know, you are so precious to Jesus. You need to stay away from the ledge. The ledge is our temptation. Stay as far away from the ledge as possible, and that is the way to keep you safe. Solomon said that to his son. Stay away from temptation so you will not be tempted. That's the way to be safe. Thank you. Amen. Amen to that. The scripture reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13. It's spoken from the New International Version. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So saith the Lord. someone who dares to love you and his arms are open wide waiting there for you to run inside there is someone who cares and when you reach for him he's there I pray you'll learn somehow, somewhere, Jesus is that someone who cares. One mistake made in your past holds to you hard and fast and mocks 
one might have been. There's no place for you to hide, you know, cause you have to ride time and time again. I'm not gonna stand here and tell you everything's gonna be alright. There is no way that I can do just what you're going through tonight. But there's someone who cares. Mm. Oh, there's someone who dares to love you. And his arms are open wide, waiting there for you to run inside. And there is Somehow, somewhere, Jesus is that someone who cares. I can see it hurts you bad. I don't want to see you sad. Just open up your heart to find the love that you never, never Thank you for the praise set tonight. Thank you for the great story. Thank you for our uh, ballet dancer. You were terrific. So, God bless everybody. We're glad to uh, have you with us on LOBN worship tonight. The uh, subject tonight, we call it the greatest of all time. Do you still believe that Jesus is the greatest of all time? So I first started working on this. Uh, our Los Angeles Rams were in the playoffs, and they were hoping to get into the Super Bowl. They did, not, they did not make it, so just bear with me in my little parable. But let's say we do get into the Super Bowl <laughs> against Tampa Bay, against Tom Brady. Everybody says Tom Brady is the greatest of all time. And you got to make a good case for him. In his 40s, and he's, he's in the Super Bowl every year, one championship after another. We hate him. We're tired of him taking that away from us. So finally, we're in the game, and we're going to play. But we're behind in the game, 28 to 24. And we lose a couple of our quarterbacks. Oh, I think we were, we were 28-17. We were two touchdowns behind. And all of a sudden, we've got nobody. What are we going to do? And there's an old guy standing over here to the side. He's got a ram shirt on. He said, uh, you need a quarterback? <laughs> yeah, we do. He said, look, an old man. He said, I'm older. I was playing before you were born. But I can still play. Okay, I guess we need you. He comes onto the field. 
We're in the one yard line. We got 99 yards to go. And he says, You guys, you run as fast as you can. Clear to the other end of the field. I'll get it to you. Don't you worry about me. And so we began, and those guys ran out to the end. And he threw it from one end to the other. Unbelievable. And our guy jumped up and got it on his fingertips and pulled it in. Now we're 28 24. Everybody's rocking now. People are starting to get excited. Maybe, who is this guy? Sure enough, we look on the back, and here it is, J.C. He plays defense, too. Tom Brady now has the ball. Tom Brady threw it. This guy jumps like 15 feet in the air and goes and gets the ball down. Maybe, maybe. 70,000 people are cheering. 50 million people are watching on television. Who is this guy? And he's got the ball. We've got five seconds to go. He takes the ball. He's going to run it himself. He begins to run around to the right, and everyone begins to follow him, and all of a sudden, he reverses the field. He goes the other way, and there's two guys he's got to beat. He's an old guy. These two guys come after him, and he's running, and we're all watching. 70,000 people are cheering. We're all watching. And he lunges, and he pushes the ball over the end zone, and we won. And we lift him up on our shoulders. 70,000 people are shouting, J.C., J.C., J.C. And the great moment. After the game is over and Tom Brady comes over and he bows down and he said, they say that I am the greatest of all time, but no, you're the greatest of all time. It's just a parable. But my question is to you tonight, wherever you are, whoever you are, do you believe? That Jesus is the greatest of all time. They call the goat. Do you really? Do you? Ganem, do you believe? Jesus is still the greatest of all time? You really believe it today? Do you believe in your heart and soul? Or have some other things in your life nosed out in front of Jesus? Is he the greatest of all time in your life? We argue about Muhammad Ali. Some would say the greatest of all time. People want to say LeBron James. Those of us from the Chicago era say, no, 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 Michael Jordan. Greatest of all time. Is Jesus in your soul of souls the greatest of all time? Jesus goes to the synagogue He hasn't come out yet. This is his coming out service. And they said, here, Jesus, you read the scripture. And he turns with the scroll until he finds Isaiah 61. We now read it in Luke 4. And he begins to read these famous verses. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And you know the rest of the passage Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and all of that. Then he rolled up the scriptures, and it says, he looked at the crowd, and he said, today the scriptures are fulfilled. He's making a claim to be the greatest of all time. He says, I'm the one you're looking for, people. What? You're just a carpenter? You are nothing. I have a friend. He's on the board here. He's a great, great man. And I've been helping him uh, the last few weeks trying to write a book of his life. He's had been on church leadership everywhere. And he told me a couple stories where he has had to sit down with the brethren. You know who the brethren are, the leaders of the church. And he's trying to do his work. He's a president of an organization. And they're always over in the, in the way, questioning and questioning. And finally, he'd had enough. And he said, we need, to, we need to meet. And he sat down and he said to one of these high vice presidents of our church, I appreciate your work. I appreciate what you do. 
but there can only be one president of this organization, and you're looking at him. And you said that a couple different times in his life. You're looking at him. And Jesus stands up in front of a crowd, and he says, you've been looking for the Messiah all these years. Well, I just want you to know, you're looking at him. I am the one. Whatever you need, I am the one who can do it for you. Jesus went through all through his gospels. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I am the water. I am the water of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the bread and the re- bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way. Whoever goes through me will be saved. Unbelievable statements. He said, I am the one you're looking for. You're looking at him. You're looking at him. He says he's going to heal the brokenhearted. You're brokenhearted today. I just came from the villa down the street here, anointed an elder, my head elder back in Chicago. He's not good. Great, great man, doctor. So we prayed for him brokenhearted. Jim Neergard, one of the finest Christian men I have ever met. We worked together with Quiet Hour many times. He went with me for the, one of the last big trips in, in the Philippines and Mindanao. Great human being. Passed away. Funerals tomorrow afternoon. Online, Jim Neergard. Another funeral on Monday. You're brokenhearted. Jesus says, I can heal a brokenhearted. In fact, Jesus says, whatever you need, I am the one. If you're stuck, I can make you one stuck. If you don't have any hope, I can give you light at the end of the tunnel. I am who you are looking for. Whatever you need, you're not going to find it out there. I am the one. Amazing statement by Jesus. I am the one you're looking for. What I decided to do today is to go through the story of Jesus. Maybe you'll say, I think we know all that, Pastor Dan. But I just want to put this into your mind and burn it into your soul so that no one can ever take it away from you. There's an enemy out there whose one purpose every day is to take you away from Jesus and Jesus away from you. And he will find a way, either by arguments or by politics or by theology or by something. And I want to know, can you hold on to this? And do you know the story of Jesus and your belief so strongly that no one could ever take it away? It starts in heaven when the three, whatever that three is, the us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now we have a problem down in this world and it looks like it's going to take everything. Someone's going to have to go. Jesus says, I'll be the one. I've preached before, this is not an automatic, this is not the Disney cars that are on, uh, on a string and no one can move them anywhere, and you have no choice about what's going to happen. God had a choice, and he gave his son, and there was a risk. It, could not, it might not have worked out. Jesus comes down here, and they may never see him again, and he may never be back in heaven again. He gave his life. I've got two sons. I don't know what that would be like. I tried to imagine what it would be like to stand and put one of my sons on a plane to go to Afghanistan or somewhere. Unbelievable. How, I, how could I do that? I waited a long time for those two boys. Now I'm going to let them go on a plane and never see them again. That's what God the Father and Jesus did up there in heaven. We're going to go through... The core beliefs of Jesus. Alden Thompson's a professor up at Walla Walla, retired now, teaches some. And he uh, did his doctorate in Scotland, and he talked about the castles. And every castle had what they called a keep, a little place where the battle would begin to get hot. They would put their women, they'd put their children, they'd put their documents in the keep. Not much fun in there, no windows, it's not safe. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's safe. Outside is not safe. You put your things you want to protect the most in the keep. 
And he said, uh, what's in the keep? When you come to your belief in Jesus, what are the bottom line ideas that are non-negotiable, irreducible? You have to believe these things or you are not a follower of Jesus. This is Orthodox Christianity. The bottom line, seven. Number one, the virgin birth. An angel came to choose Mary and let her know she was going to be the one. We call this the incarnation. That Jesus somehow had to be both divine and human. So he's going to have a human mother. But he is not going to have a human father. He's going to be born of the Holy Spirit because he's divine and human. Not everyone believes this. That's what the Bible says. That something about Jesus was remarkable. It's a miracle. Jesus was born of a virgin. I believe that. I'll die for this. And Jesus came down into our world and lived life on our terms and in our world as a human being. You've heard the famous story of the fire. This town had a building go on fire, and all they had was a volunteer fire department, ancient old b- fire truck. And they called for the fire truck to come. The guys came running out of the house, jumped on the truck, and came, but it came sailing right into the middle of the fire. It didn't stop outside like you're supposed to. And those poor guys on that truck had to get out with their hoses and fight their way out through the fire. The old man who they, they saved his building, he said, boy, I've never seen anything like that before. He said, I'm going to give you $1,000. That was amazing. Then he asked the fire chief, what are you going to do with my $1,000? He said, first we're going to buy brakes for the old truck. That's what Jesus did. He came right into the middle of the fire. He didn't just shout from heaven with a megaphone and say, now now, hear this and tell us what we had to do. He came down into our world, lived with, we call it contextualization, we call it incarnationalism. Whatever you want to call it. Jesus came here, born of a virgin. That's what we believe. That's the story. Famous verse, the word became flesh. Message Bible says Jesus came into the neighborhood, came into our world. That's number one. Non-negotiable, sin to keep. Number two, he lived a perfect life. You think about this. He had to do it from the first minute to the last, but never compromise, never shortcut, never lash out. Kind, gentle, gracious Jesus every time. I was in college when the Lakers played the 33 games and won 33 in a row. <laughs> a couple teams have come close. Miami almost was there. I was listening to the game when they finally lost hoping we'd keep our Laker record. I watched that team that won the 33 games. Great. They finally lost. I was in Kyler also with Bill Walton years. Bill Walton and I are the same age. Bill Walton, 88 games in a row. They've been beat by the girls now. Some of these people can win every game for two or three years and don't lose one time. But eventually they lose. Jesus had to live his whole life. Never sinned a single time. If he sinned a single time, he'd have to die for his own sins. It says, we made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Lived a perfect life. And he makes it until the end. Satan was there to pull him away. The greatest temptations in the world, Satan was throwing in front of him. But finally, Jesus shouts out on the cross, it is finished. I made it. Made it to the end, undefeated, never lost. Lived the perfect life. Number two. Number three, the cross. We come to the cross of Jesus. He died for our sins. Most of us believe that it kind of went into high gear in the garden. Jesus goes into the garden on his own. Somehow, he call it the vicarious atonement, he begins to take our sin. In total empathy, he begins to feel as if he's committed every sin that has ever been committed. 
your sins, my sins. Not just lies and getting angry, rapes and murders and all the rest of it. He can't find God anymore. He's been with God every day for thousands, millions of years. Now he can't find God. Sweating blood. Begging the disciples to pray with him, but they won't do it. They can't do it. Jesus dying for us. Then, of course, we have the nails, crown of thorns, the whipping. I preached the other night about the uh, preacher who came to our church in Garden Grove and unbelievable in front of two, three hundred people on a panel said, uh, I don't really think the cross is that big of a deal. It's the resurrection that saves us, not the cross. What? All the churches that put a cross on it, all the people who wear a cross. And my head elder called us on the way home. He said, did I hear that? And Jesus, who has the scars in his hands in heaven, had to hear someone come down here and say, I don't think the cross really matters. That's not what saves us. Die for the, I'll die for the cross. It's in my keep. Virgin birth. Lived a perfect life. The cross. Jesus died for me. It is finished. He didn't quit. Could have quit. Stayed until the end. I would have quit. Jesus says he came to set the captives free. He said, today this is fulfilled in your presence. Jesus set the captives free. We believe Jesus set us free from our sins. Is that in Jesus Christ our sins are gone and they're gone forever? Do you believe that? Is that in your keep? And no one can take that away from you. Can we just nail this one thing down? Adventists, which we are here, do not believe that we are saved by works or by Ten Commandments or by keeping the Sabbath. We believe we are saved by Jesus. A girl wrote me a note the other day. I feel like God is punishing me for my sins all the time. There aren't enough minutes in the day for God to punish me enough. I am scared to death of one more mess up and I will be punished again. No, no, no. I have a lady in my church, the last church where her husband, I did the wedding, married a person not part of our church. And he came at me trying to accuse us of being saved by works and by being saved by the Ten Commandments. Do I believe we should keep the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Do I think the world would be better if more of us kept the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. But can we be crystal clear? We are not saved by any Ten Commandments. We are saved by Jesus and the cross. It's the cross of Jesus. That's all there is. I said to this man tonight, I don't know if I'll ever see him again. Had a chance to pray with him tonight. And I said, my friend, it's Jesus. He's wondering where he stands. I said, you have Jesus, then you're good. Jesus. Always Jesus. He shouted out, it is finished. We are saved by grace alone. You stand before the judgment. All you have to know is that you are with Jesus. And it will be okay in the judgment. I was thinking this week. I went down twice this week to help my brother down in San Diego build a house. I'm semi-retired. I thought, I can help him out. I don't know much about building. But he needed help. My father is dead. I said, I'll go help my brother. So I've been going 20, 25 times. I drive two hours each way. Spend all day hammering and lifting and carrying stuff. And then I come home. And the thought could cross my mind to say, I, I'm stacking up a good amount of points here. I'm a pretty good guy. Go down and help my brother. I've been a pastor all my life. I've gone all over the world. I've given a lot of money to projects. I preach for LLBN for crying out loud. I think... Maybe I don't even need grace anymore. I think I've worked it out on my own. I will never work it out enough. You can't be good enough. It's Jesus, Jesus, by grace alone. Number four, the resurrection. I agree with him. The resurrection is huge. What if he had stayed, died and stayed dead? Just a grave there in Israel somewhere. What's that? Greatest miracle that's ever happened. Jesus came out of that grave. They thought they had him. 
They thought they had him locked up in there. They had all the demons in the universe to keep him in there. They rolled the stone, had the German, the, the, the Roman guard, and he comes walking out of there. I tell these fun little stories. <laughs> the guy that landed in New York and got in the taxi and told the guy where to go. And then he saw where he was supposed to go. He tapped the guy on the shoulder, and the guy almost ran over a few cars, finally stopped. He said, don't ever touch me like that while I'm driving again. My first day driving a taxi, the last 15 years, I've been driving a funeral hearse. I thought the guy woke up. Jesus did it. Can you imagine what that would be like to see someone that you know died? I've done hundreds of funerals. You see, they're dead. They're in the in the grave, and all of a sudden, they're alive. I've been asked to go raise people from the dead before. I was scared to death. What's going to happen if I, what if it works? Dead person starts to come out of there. What, do you hug them? What do you do with a person who was dead? Now they're alive. But that's what happened with Jesus. He was dead. And he came alive, and 500 people said, we saw him alive. And he says, I have the keys now to heavens and earth. Why I am a Christian, why I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus is alive. The other leaders of the world, religions are all dead. Our Savior is alive. Number five is the ascension, going to heaven. He says, I'll come back someday the same way. Don't take time to go with this. Number six, the high priestly ministry in heaven. Jesus is in heaven every day and receiving your prayers, guiding the church, whispering to you every day what to do. He's this high priest. He knows you up in heaven. Number seven, second coming. That's what's going to wrap it up. Wouldn't do any good to die for us if he doesn't come back and take us home. We still believe in the second coming of Jesus. So those are my questions for you today. Do you still believe it? Is there anything that could happen that could take it away? Could you have doubts? A whole magazine with 40 pages this week came out. Pastors with doubts. I understand the doubts. Do you doubt Jesus? Do you still believe Jesus is the greatest of all time? This is who he said he was. Do you believe the virgin birth, he lived a perfect life. You believe in the cross of Jesus, the resurrection, the ascension, the high priestly ministry, and the second coming. These are the seven, the unreducible, irreducible seven. Jesus is God with us. That's what we believe. And he's going to take us home to be with us, and we're going to be in heaven, God with us forever. Bottom line seven, do you believe it? Is there any politics in the church that could take it away? Some scandal? Some rumor you hear, oh, okay, forget about it. I've had a lot of people tell me, Pastor Dan, I'm done. Some issue. Let me finish with this. The Bible says there's going to be another angel. We talk a lot about the three angels. We talk a lot about the four angels. The Bible says after the four angels, there's another angel. The fifth angel. He says, I saw another angel coming from the east, having the seal of the living God. Who is this? You do whatever you want with this. I'll just tell you what I believe. Who else is, who is coming from the east? Who is coming from the east? Isn't that Jesus? He is Michael the archangel. He is Jesus coming from the east. Is the one with the seal of the living God. Why is this important, my dear friends? Because we believe that Christ is going to be the one who's going to do the sealing. It is so tempting for a lot of people to believe that Jesus saves you at the beginning and he died for your sins and Jesus has taken care of your sins. But now it is up to you to gradually grow and get victory and there's going to be a day when you are going to have to be sealed at the end, not because of what Jesus did, because of what you do. And here it says, no, Jesus is the seal. There is never a time when you're going to be saved by your own works. You can't get to the end without Jesus. Jesus is the one who saved us. We are sealed at the beginning of our Christian life because of what Jesus did, and we will be saved at the end of our Christian life because of Jesus. Jesus is going to bring a seal. 
and seal you with the living God's seal. It's Jesus. Are you locked in? Are you locked in with Jesus? Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It's Jesus. Jesus is it. It's only Jesus. It is finished. There's no one else that's involved with it. So I invite you to uh, put down your markers today and say nothing will ever take this away. I am a follower of Jesus. Jesus died for me. And I believe all seven virgin births lived a perfect life, died on the cross for me, rose from the grave for me. He rose and went back to heaven. God accepted the sacrifice. He lives for the last 2,000 years as our high priest in heaven for us. And he is coming back. Those are the seven. I'm not giving any of those up. How about you? Enjoy the song, Worthy is the Lamb, and then we'll come back and wrap it up at the end. I followed Bill Hybels in Willow Creek in Chicago most of my life. We're just a couple years different in age. 
And just before he retired, they had an Easter service, 26,000 people and multiple campuses everywhere besides that. And here this old man now, like me, with white hair, been preaching Jesus, started a church in a movie theater, and now look at this. And he went over the gospel and the story of Jesus about like I have done. And then he said, when he was all done, he says, I'm proud of Christianity. I just love it. All the other religions, their leader is dead. I am proud of Jesus. I'm proud of Christianity. And he said, I hope you're proud of Christianity. Can you be proud tonight of Jesus? He is the greatest of all time. Vow tonight that you will never give him up, that you will give your life to him. He is the greatest in your life today, and you are sealed to Jesus, and no one can ever take that away. That's what we stand for here at LLBN and LLBN Worship. Be with us again next week. God bless you all.